Our Waterdeep Dragon Heist session starts off with the players waking up in their creepy house. Since they had rescued Raynar Never Remember from the clutches of the Xanathar Guild, they had received payment from Volo. Unfortunately, he didn't have the actual gold on hand, so he gave them this old rundown house, which definitely doesn't have creepy ghosts running around it, despite the floating candlesticks and blood on the walls. Zumbo woke up. From the closet, they heard, meow, meow, starling and scratching. He remembered, oh yeah, right, remove curse. He opened the closet to see a tied-up tough time, who had gotten cursed by a were-rat. He slaps on the back of Tuff's head, whoop ham, and casts Remove Curse. The were-rat visage starts slowly fading away, his elongated nose shrinking back into his face, and long claws retreating back to their normal length. Once Tuff was out of the curse, the group made their way downstairs, where everyone else was eating. They had moved a table to the center of the room, with several lopsided chairs. Ren had an apron on and was cooking up breakfast. Outside, the newspapers were being delivered to their door, but instead of a mailman, the newspapers were folded up into paper birds, which fluttered over the city in a massive cloud. The wings made up a plumage of delicately creased pages and decorative white and black lines crisscrossing their body. As the news birds soared over the city, they scouted out their house or home. When they found their spot, the papers descended, landing on everyone's porch. The players heard a tap, tap, tap at the front door of the newspaper, wanting to be let inside, which, when opened up, politely unfurled and lay flat. The players grabbed the paper and pulled it inside. Opening it was a splashy mess of moving pictures and images of advertisements all trying to grab their attention. Their characters were a little overwhelmed by the small text on the page, blaring headlines, and magically animated images. So, a little bit of forewarning from me as a GM. I have kind of an exposition dump for you guys. I'll, I'll try and keep it as brief as I can, uh, so I don't drown people in info. Uh, anyway, here goes. The first article on the page was, Noble House Outed in Waterdeep Secret Smuggling Ring. The article went on to read, Romalia Haventree of the Haventree Estate has been arrested. Officers were following an investigation and monitoring the situation for several weeks before arresting Miss Haventree. Searching through their estate, they were able to find several contraband items, a few notable ones being blood rods, blasting toads, and lightning chains, as well as cursed magical items. Reporters have asked Laryl Silverhand for answers on who else was connected to the smuggling ring, but she has declined to comment, refusing to answer. That was the headlining article. The next smaller ones flipped through were titled, The Dreaded Manjoon Seen in Waterdeep? Question mark? Someone ended up in the hospital after they got hit by a lightning bolt. Some witnesses say that the culprit looked like the dreaded evil wizard Manchun. There's an officer on the scene, Barnabas Blastwind, who reports, We don't think it's Manchun. It might have been some pranksters trying to scare people with a disguised self-spell. But we're looking into it and we request that if anyone has any information, please let us know. The article then goes into a brief history of Manchun. He's an evil, egotistical wizard who grew to power, made several duplicates of himself, which then made several more duplicates and clones, which then made several more duplicates. Eventually, the clones came to despise one another and led to the Manchun Wars, where each of the different copies were trying to destroy each other. The Sword Coast was rocked by these battles between these megalomaniacal wizards. The last time the walking statues had moved, it was protecting Waterdeep from a wild kraken that had been controlled by a Manchun who was trying to kill another Manchun who had resurrected another primordial. The city itself had just ended up in the crossfire. The article then goes on to explain and to reassure the readers that the Manchun Wars had ended decades ago, and even though there had been these stories popping up, the Manchuns had all died a long time ago and assured them that the police were looking for the prankster. The next article on the list was, Days of Wonders Fair coming up. There's going to be a fair soon. Everyone in town was bustling with excitement. As they're reading the paper, Red notices Tuff sneak outside of the house. Yesterday, when I had been describing the surrounding businesses, I had said that one of them was a toy store with dolls in the window. Tuff had said, I'm going to be spending so much money there. But he's an adult and doesn't want to be seen doing quote-unquote childish things. So he decided to sneak out of the house and up the street to the store while they were eating breakfast. After a bit of negotiating and haggling, Tuff returns, and in his arms is a massive owlbear plushie. Why'd you get that, Tuff? Look, it waves at you! The owlbear plushie picked up his little arm and waved it at them. This one's called Hooter Father! Since Squiggly's owlbear plushie's Hooterson, I decided to make one called Hooter Father! I'll make an entire set! While we were at the shop, we had a very long negotiation, which involved questions like, How much is a stuffed animal? 
How much is a stuffed owl bear? What if I want this owl bear to wave? What if I want it to be able to hoot when I squeeze it? Uh, what if I buy in bulk? How much would that cost? Assuming, of course, that I'd be buying a family, you know, the full set. So it would be heavily discounted, right? Knowing that my purchase is going to be advertising your business, of course. At the door, they hear a knock. They answer, and it's Raynar, the guy that they saved last time. He introduces himself. I apologize for my brevity last night. I was so caught up with being captured and escaping that I just had to flee. I've come here to fully explain to the group what's going on, and why the Xanathar Guild is so keen on hunting me down. Also, me, the GM, has to apologize again uh, to the audience, because there's going to be another l bit of long info dump. Raynar goes into uh, a story, which uh, is also the pitch for this campaign. My father is Dagult Never Remember. He was the last open lord of Waterdeep. Who? Ren asked. <coughs> well, you, there's a player, don't know, but I'm sure your character does. Nope, Ren said. Okay, so just a brief history of Waterdeep and the politics here. So in the city, you have local guilds, uh, like the Baker's Guild, the Butcher's Guild, who run kind of the most of the Waterdeep's local politics, as well as kind of local judges. But the city itself at the tippy top is run by the Masked Lords, an elusive group of mysterious nobles who hide their identity. If someone draws their interest, they're able to receive a secret invite into their numbers. Among the masked lords, there is one among their numbers who reveals themselves to the public. This person is their face, their voice, the one who enacts their rules, and the representative to the rest of the city. The current open lord is Lyrell Silverhand. She is trying to pick up the pieces after the disastrous run of the previous open lord, Raynar's father, never remember. My father, Raynar explained, lost a lot of favor during his own run. He seemed to have little care for Waterdeep's concerns, and even less so for the rest of the Sword Coast. In addition, after he passed away, the Council had discovered that he had secretly embezzled a hoard of gold from Waterdeep's coffers. He had secreted the money away to a hidden cache. By the time they had discovered this, several of the people who had helped him had gotten a modified memory cast on them, altering their minds and making them forget where it was. But interrogating his crew, they had heard stories of a vault overflowing with gold, magic items, and gems hidden somewhere in Waterdeep. No doubt he had done this so that he could find the money himself again, but never got the chance since he had died early. Once the rumors came out, there was a hunt for the vault, but the trail was cold, and the vault forgotten. However, stories have re-emerged to the Stone of Golor, which is supposedly a key to the Horde, a story that if someone were to find the stone, they'd be able to find the gold. The Xanathar Guild is after it, because they want to use the money to take over the Undercity of Waterdeep. If they succeed, it could plunge Waterdeep into a Dark Age, run by a tyrannical beholder overlord. Oh no, Tuff said. That sounds really, really bad. It, it is, Radar continued. Here's the thing, though. Last night, when you had asked me if I knew anything... I did, and during the interrogations, I accidentally let something slip to the Xanathar Guild. I knew that the real reason no one had found the vault yet was that my father had actually split the stone, split it into shards. If someone were to find each shard, they could assemble it into the full key. One of the hidden shards is hidden somewhere in the court of the White Bull, in the Trades Guild. The Xanathar Guild found out, and I have no doubt that they're sending agents out there now to scout it out and find the pieces. Oh. Okay, Ren said. There's a bit of an awkward silence, and I explained, Okay, uh, this is the this is the plot of the module, is either getting the gold before them or stopping them. However, most of the players had characters that were disinterested in gold. Zumbo explained, I just worship Twilight, I'm a cleric, I don't care about gold. Peleos explained, I just worship dark powers, what would I need money for? Tuff was like, I'm just looking to be with friends and have an adventure. Well, uh, finding the gold is kind of like an adventure, and if everyone else goes with you, you could be friends. With a resounding, meh, we got nothing better to do, the players set off on their grand and epic quest, heading off to thwart the Xanathar's Guild to find the gold and keep the city of Waterdeep safe from their clutches, even though they don't really give two flying fucks about the gold. <laughs> Goodbye, friends. Hope fortune favors you. Raynar left the group. Oh, by the way, one more thing before I leave. He handed them a stack of papers. You can use these if you need to contact me. 
I let them know that they're basically mail notes. Uh, you can kind of write a message on the note. Uh, it will fold itself into a paper airplane, and if you toss it out a window, it will go to their address. Uh, this is a common magical item in Waterdeep, and whenever you're like walking around outside, you can normally see a few of these paper airplane messengers uh, soaring overhead. You can also purchase more of these in a nearby shop if you run out. Once that was taken care of, Raynar left, and the others were preparing to leave as well. Okay, time for us to leave. Nope, no, wait, still got one more thing. <laughs> As you guys are preparing to leave, a carriage pulls up to the front. This one looks like out of a fairy tale, ornately decorated. All of the drivers and attendants are wearing white gloves and snappy suits with their family livery. Zumbo's like, ugh, who are these fuckers? Think they could just roll up to our shitty house with their shitty carriage? Stepping out of it was a couple with jet black hair and loud, vibrant orange dresses. The gentleman had a walking cane with him, but didn't seem to need it. These were two wealthy Waterdavian nobles. The gentleman said, Oh, we seem to have caught them at an inconvenient time, haven't we, darling? Are we troubling them? I don't know. I'll ask them, darling. The gentleman said, Might we have a moment to discuss business? I assure you, it will be much worth your time. The rest of the group was like, Sure, yeah, I guess we got nothing better to do. They came inside, kicking up dirt onto their normally immaculate shoes. Their home was made up of three floors. The bottom floor was what used to be a bar, with long rows of glasses, serving area, and tables and chairs covered in white cloth. A set of stairs went into the upper floors, where they actually lived. My, 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 this place is so, um, what is the word I'm looking for, darling? Uh, big. I, it's almost half the size of a summer home. Big, yes, big, that means potential. Zumbo's like, what do you want? Well, you see, the real question is, what do you want? Ren seemed confused. Well, we asked first, so it'd be impolite of you to turn around on us like that. Right, 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 you are, he said. I am someone who finds out potential projects and then gives them a leg up, financially speaking, of course. Zumbo's like, oh, yeah, I think I know about these. Back where I come from, we call them leeches. His wife explained, We're here because we want to help you develop this place. Nana was the one who pointed out, How did you guys find out so fast that we moved in here? We didn't even know that we were moving in here till the middle of last night. Ah, details, details, the wife said, waving her hand. We're rather well connected. Keep our ears low to the ground on all the new comings. That we do, darling, always thinking of the community. His wife leaned over to him. Don't you think we should introduce ourselves? Ah, yes, we did forget, didn't we? I am Victorio Casalanta, and this is my dear sweet Amalia. Victoria continued on to explain, So the plan is to give you an initial upfront gold that will help you develop this place, and then in return, we'll charge you a monicum fee. Wren was confused. Wait, so you want to give us money, but then we have to pay you money? I mean, like, what are we talking about here? Like, if you give us 100 gold pieces, we could give you, like, 10 back. But if you give us 10 and want to get 100 back, like, that sounds bad. I think that's how numbers work. Anyway, point is, I think you guys seem like honest, nice folks, and I don't want to be giving you a bad deal is all. Victorio explained, we can make this simple for you. They called over one of their attendants, who produced a long formal scroll. It was a contract. If you make a deal with us, we'll promise we can help you to turn this place around, give it a facelift, and make it whatever you want it to be. <sighs> so, the players knew that these guys are sketchy as fuck, but they all agreed that, yeah, like, their characters might actually all go along with it. They all decided to give the decision to the character with the highest intelligence. So, they looked around and checked everyone's character sheets. The question was... Who in the group has the highest intelligence? And the character with the highest int was... Tough Time! Yes, Tough Time was the character with the most intelligence. Here you go, they said, handing him the contract. You can go over it and we'll just go along with whatever you decide. And Tuff was like, well, sure thing. Oh, geez, that's a lot of words on this page. And some don't even make sense. Like the first letter of each of these lines is E-G-G-S or eggs. That's silly. Why would it say eggs there? So I have him take time to look it over, make intelligence roll. 
he asked me, does it seem like a good idea? And I said, yeah, it actually seems like it's a great deal. Is there any catch? He asked me. Not that you can tell. It seems fair. Hmm. The castle lanterns were patiently waiting. Tuff was twirling the quill in his hand, hemming and hawing. Well, do we have a deal? Mm, no. What do you mean? What's the problem? You guys seem like you're mean. What? You don't seem like nice people. You seem like you're the bad guys. There was a brief pause as the Castellanters took a moment to recover. Then they looked at each other. There was a wave of incredulity passing over Victorio's face, followed by a hint of anger. It's their first time meeting us, dear, Amalia said. They're not from the city. Uh, leaning onto his shoulder, trust takes time. Right, right, dear, he said. Victorio seemed taken aback. He had always prided himself on knowing the right thing to say and how to say it and when to say it. It was a well-learned trade, and he had coned his craft well, but for one of the few times in his life, he didn't know how to respond. People didn't normally tell him, you just look like a meanie. The man who normally had an answer for everything, this time, was answerless himself. Uh, yes, yes, uh, trust is important, he said, recomposing himself and regaining his friendly demeanor. He rolled up the contract. Uh, let's take our leave. By the way, one last thing, Victorio asked before heading out. Unfortunately, we are in a bit of a bind right now. Amalia piped up. Yes, it's about our children. Yes, he said, putting his hand on his wife's shoulder. I'm afraid our children have run away from home. Amalia had a single tear rolling down her cheek. We're so worried about them. There, there, dear, he said, removing his delicate handkerchief from his coat and wiping the tear. Do you, by any chance, happen to know about any vagrant children the children of course the party knew were the three vagrants it seemed like two of them were their kids the players knew that the couple were sketchy so they decided not to give them any information about them nana was like we'll keep an eye out for the little youngsters and let you know if we see anything knowing full well that they were definitely not going to be letting them know you know about these youngsters always going off on their big adventures you know but we can't keep them safe it's up to them and each other to protect one another. Hmm, I guess. Victorio didn't know how quite to take that. He bowed low. Thank you so much. Any information at all would be helpful. We were just so worried about them and want them to be home safe. On their way out, they brought up, If you ever want to make a deal with us, we'll be in touch. With that done, the group's next order of business... Instead of going to the trades ward, where the clue from Raynar was leading them, they instead had one other business to take care of. The previous day, while they were trapped, they had gotten helped by an insider, Thorvin, who had helped them to break out. In return, Thorvin had asked them to contact one of their spies, Maxine, who was at an intersection in the castle ward. He had given them the junction of two streets. They had to tell Maxine that someone was hunting down the Harpers, and it wasn't Xanathar. As they leave the house, they look back up to see a figure in the window which turns away. It was just more of the creepy house being creepy. Okay, y'all, before we do anything else, we gotta find that one contact with the Hoppas. Thorvin wanted us to find him at a certain intersection. The group go there to the two streets. Nan asked, Hmm, uh, did your friend give us any other details about who we were supposed to be looking for? Ren shook his head. Raid not. Hmm... The group was at a loss for exactly what to do. I'll ask around, see if I can find someone. Ren entered a nearby shop. Tuff had a different tactic. Maxine! Maxine! He shouted. Where are you? Ren was in the flower shop. Begging your pardon, ma'am. I'm looking for someone. I was wondering if you had a moment. She was packing one of the pots with dirts and looked up from her work. Of course, dear. What can I do you for? Uh, is there someone called Maxine? She chuckled. Uh, oh, I think there must be some kind of a mix-up. Er, why is that? Do you know her? Of course I know her. She's our best worker, Maxine. She's such a good girl. Outside, Tuff was going, Maxine! Maxine! Behind him, in a terse whisper, was, Shut up! Shut the fuck up! He noticed a very panicked horse, with her eyes darting back and forth, head low. Shut up! 
Maxine, is that you? Yes, it is me. Now shut up, she said through gritted teeth, trying to avoid notice. Wow, you're a horse, he said. I didn't expect the spy we were looking for to be a horse. Anyway, I was sent here from the spy in Xanathar, and they wanted us to tell you... As he's talking, the horse is getting skittish and trots away, trying to get away from him without causing more of a scene. Wait, hold on, where are you going? The horse ignored him, dragging the carriage behind her without a driver in it, but Tuff was chasing after her. She then went to a gallop, trying to put as much distance between Tuff and her as she could. Wait, Tuff called out, but his small little leggies was too slow to keep pace with the horse. So he makes a very strange decision going, I need to slow her down. Wait. He has an idea. I know just the thing. So Tuff pulls out his crossbow and fires a shot at the carriage wheel. I go, okay, you hit the carriage wheel. Breaking the axle, uh, the cart starts rocking back and forth, tumbling around and slowing her down. So she can't get away from you. But the carriage was actually quite far away and she did have to fire through a crowd to get to it. Tuff comes over to her. Anyway, what I was saying was... Before that, he gets interrupted by several guards who rush over. We heard reports of a runaway horse carriage and crossbow shots being fired at a crowd. Excuse me, I was not firing at a crowd. I was firing through a crowd. Tuff is indignant. I have impeccable aim and a perfectly reasonable explanation. The guard was like, which is, Oh, uh, I'm not supposed to tell you about that because it's secret spy stuff. Tuff was arrested, and the horse was hauled away. Maxine was giving Tuff a death glare at, while she was taken away by the guards. Tuff was brought before the head guard, who released him under the order that he had to return to a court hearing tomorrow, where he would be able to explain his case and potentially sentenced for his actions. The group met up with him by the courthouse. I met with Maxine, and I got her the message. Tuff gave them the thumbs up. I call that a mission complete. Wren shrugged. Yeah, well, I guess that's one way of thinking about it. I guess there's nothing more for us to do here. Let's move on to the trades ward. The party went to the trades ward to the court of the White Bull. And I give them another info dump. In this district, there was a massive battle that had historically taken place here. Waterdeep had been breached by the evil god. Uh, his name's not easy to pronounce. Shile Raura Tyler, who was trying to take over the city and would have fallen were it not for the archmage uh, Thalongar confronting her. In a massive spell battle between the two, the Longar won. But their fight broke the weave in this area so much that Azuth, the god of magic, had to descend down off his throne and in person show up and fix it, stretching the weave back to restore order. But the area itself is still bears scars from this fight. Because of that, this area is still a place where magic is chaotic and sometimes doesn't do what you expect it to. There are stories of people going down alleys and ending up in different places, buildings moving on their own, and statues whispering secrets to people. And according to the book, uh, apparently spellcasting and magic items are banned here. Uh, but I didn't read that line when I was running it originally. Uh, I just found it out when I went to recheck the book. The group made it to the Court of the White Bull. But there, it was crowded and loud, with people bartering and trading. In the center was a rising statue with an inscription beneath it. Prowling through the crowd, Nana was the first to notice something was off. She grabbed the others and pulled them away into the shadows. Look, she pointed, notice anything strange? The rest of the group shook their head. Those sausages, Tuff said. They look really good. Nice catch, Nana. No, Nana explained. Those dwarves, they seem a little familiar. A little too familiar? She recognized them as Xanathar agents, in disguise and exploring the statue in the area, looking for clues. Well, what now? Wren shrugged. Eh, let's go talk to him. He left the shadows. Wren, what are you doing? Nana asked. They might have some clues we need. Don't you remember what happened last time? Nah, this is a public area. They can't start a fight here. She watches Wren approach them. Groaning, she slinks away to hide, waiting and watching in the shadows. Ren approached the dwarves, who immediately recognized him. They all reached under the jackets and coats for the handles of their blades and weapons. The thugs formed a line, making sure to be closed in case any of their comrades needed help. One of the thugs said, You got some nerves thinking you can show your ugly mug here. Hey, hey now, Ren said. That's putting your toe across the line, calling someone ugly. That's impolite. I'm gonna make a deal with you, the leader said. We can't really talk here. A bit too much commotion. Why don't we talk there? He gestured to a dark, spoopy alley by an unused warehouse. 
The players thought about it for a bit and decided, yeah, sure, that sounds fine. I think their thinking was, well, hey, here it's even odds between us and the dwarves. There's five of us and there's five of them, but they only see four of us because we have Nana in the shadows who they don't know about yet. Plus, we have more resources, so we think we can take them. Plus, it's this idea that, well, we're going to have to fight them eventually. Like, if the fight doesn't happen now, they're probably going to try and stalk us back home and jump us at night. So if, if we've got to fight them sometime, we'll just do it now. Pleos had an idea. He decided, I'm going to use Disguise Self to disguise myself as one of them. So that way, I can slip in amongst them. I let him know, uh, okay, uh, I don't know how that's going to work because they're watching you right now. I think he had gotten the invocation that lets him disguise self an infinite number of times per day, and he kept waiting for a perfect opportunity to use it, but it, it never came up. So he tried it. Uh, I gave him a roll, but the dwarves just watch as his body and clothes morph into a duplicate of one of them. The disguised Peleos then goes, Hey, what are you guys doing? I'm on your side. No, you're not. Okay, he said, and flip up, turns back to normal. It was an awkward walk to the alley. As the players and NPCs were making their way there, they kept shifting backwards and forwards, turning and turning around, bulking up and moving away. Peleos was asking, Okay, I'm waiting for all the thugs that are clumped together, and we're far away from them, and I'm going to cast Fireball on them. And I let them know, uh, that doesn't happen. Like, they're interspersed amongst you. And then someone asked, I'm going to wait for them to all line up in a single file. And I'm like, that doesn't happen either. Not unless you somehow force them to. Zumbo tried to hang back to get behind, but another thug kind of rerouted and made sure to try and cut him off if he had an exit. They kept thinking, like, should I run ahead? Should I try and cast something? But ultimately, they all just kind of went along with it. No one wanted to be the one who started something. Eventually, they got to the quiet section of the alley, with the din of the trading court behind them. Okay, Ren said. You wanted to come here to talk about something? Hmm, yeah, the thug nodded. The entire group was in a circle, everyone eyeing each other over, hands on their weapons, doing a standoff, trying to circle each other like two packs of wolves hunting another. The air was very tense between the players. Nana hung back in the shadows, her two throwing knives out, ready to jump in, passing it from finger to finger, twiddling between them. But she didn't want to be the one who started it. Maybe they would talk. Maybe they would get some information. Maybe someone else would start it. After a long, belated pause, Zumbo goes, We're just gonna be killing these fuckers, right? Ren went, Probably? He shrugs, Okay! And he swings his Morningstar, smacking one of the dwarves across the back of the head, who collapses to the ground. Everyone draws their weapons and a fight starts. Players were yelling at Zemo like, why did you initiate the fight? And he's like, well, someone had to. Amongst the fighting, one of the players gets struck by a green ray from overhead and a mad cackling, ha ha ha. Popping out of invisibility was a floating head with one eyeball and a hair of tentacle eye stalks. <gasps> Xanathar! No, no, not, not Xanathar. There's actually a long list of subtypes of beholders, you know. This one was a gouth. This was one of the guys that happens to be working with Xanathar Guild. So now the players are getting worked by the aberration floating overhead, firing shots down on them. Don't worry, I got this, Nina said, and cast darkness over the fight, so that it would stop targeting them with its eye beams. Zumbo, blinded by the darkness and swinging wildly into nothingness, was not happy. Cool it with the darkness spells. Again? I can't see shit. Aren't you a Twilight Domain cleric? I like the... Book series! He says, smacking someone across the chest. While the darkness was up, Peleos was like, Now's my chance! He uses his disguised self and turns into one of the thugs. He leaps out of the darkness and goes, Yeah, guys, let's get him! Let's take him down! Uh, so, the thing is that all the other players outside of the darkness had ready to tax. Saying things like, the next time we see a thug, I'm just going to fire a crossbow bolt at his face, or or I'm going to shoot a spell at the next thug I see. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect that from the other player's perspective, in character, all they see is another guard jumping out of the darkness, so all the players unload into Paleos. Pow, 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 as he takes a set of spells, knives, crossbow bolts, and they all unload onto him. 
He turns back into himself and manages to get out only like, guys, it's me, before collapsing under all that damage. Oh, uh, that's a, that's a whoops. Even with the darkness, the players are still losing the fight. Ren casts fear. Most of the dwarves hecked up on their save as well as the Galth, so they drop their weapons and flee, sprinting away into the alleys. Ren told the group, we gotta get out of here before they come back. Nana ended the darkness spell. Tuff and Paleos were unconscious from the fight. Zumbo and Ren, the strongest two of the group, picked them up, slung them over their shoulder, and dashed away, heading into the opposite direction. Honestly, the fight ended up kind of being like that scene from Anchorman, where there's a lot of posturing, they fight in the back alley, it's a short fight, and then they just run away from each other with no one actually dying. We cut to later. Zumbo was casting healing magic on Tuff and Peleos to revive them. The group holed up in an abandoned warehouse, while the gang passes by, looking for them. Nana's like, we're really getting our money's worth from that fear spell. I know, right? It causes them both to run away and drop their weapon, and they don't get a save again unless the cast is out of sight range. What now? Tuff said, watching the alleys to see if they find them. I don't think we can take them. We'll have to wait till nightfall, Ren explained. We're going to have to rest up before taking another crack at it. Hopefully we can sneak around under the cover of night. And with the group hiding out inside of a warehouse by empty boxes, waiting till night, watching the white glow fade into oranges, into purple, to black, the players sneak back to the court of the White Bull at night. It's eerily quiet now, with the commotion of the day gone. The place was lit by a few lamps with continual flame running, casting crisscrossing shadows over the plaza. Okay guys, keep your eyes out for clues. The group split up, scouring the area, keeping their eyes open for any kind of clues that might show them where the shard was. The first thing they investigate was the statue. On it, they find an inscription. This statue is dedicated to all of the heroes who came before. May their sacrifice that they've done to protect the people never be forgotten. Then below it was a poem. Life is full of prizes. Hidden away are one of many surprises. Though some may think the odds are slim, you can follow it through thick and thin. Some make it from the written word. They'd be better off without a sword. On the road, don't trip and fall. From dream to night, through its wall. A garden of roses with secrets you'll see. A gift is there to you from me. What the fuck? The players looked over the poem again. They know that I don't take the time to read out a long-ass poem for nothing. They start asking me questions, like it talks about a sword, is the statue holding a sword, I say no, are they pointed some way, I say no. Tough Zumbo and Paleos are the first ones to tap out after a few seconds. Nah, this is some puzzle bullshit, we'll leave it to Ren and Nana to figure it out, they're good with this shit. Nana was searching the spot, checking to see if there was some kind of loose stones or insignia on the ground, something. She didn't find anything. After searching around for a bit, Ren is just kind of looking over the poem again. He goes, ah! Figuring it out, he pulls out a map of Waterdeep. He looks at the poem, then back at the notes, then back to the poem. He's pretty confident now. Yeah, yeah, I think these are directions, specifically signpost directions. On the road, don't trip and fall. It might be telling us to go for the Slipstone Road, and then it's telling us about thick and thin. There's a crossroad called the Wide Way. Uh, making it through the written word, that's pretty obviously Quill Alley. Together they follow the directions. They arrive at a labyrinthine set of streets, but nothing there really stands out. The area is a grid of alleys, with at each cross street is a rose insignia surrounded by these strange symbols. Rumors from people in the area have said that the people have gotten attacked wandering through these alleys. Nana and Ren went between the insignias, seeing if there was anything between them. As they were walking, underneath the stones, this writhing specter arose and attacked them. Finding it, they managed to bring the spirit down. Looks like that was the wrong answer. Uh, the tiles are describing a path, and if we take the wrong path or end up in the wrong area, it will summon these things. He eventually figured it out. The insignias are surrounded by these strange symbols. Some of the symbols have an intersection that match, so if we follow the matching symbols, it will show us a trail that if we follow, leads uh, somewhere. At the end of the secret path, it ended in a supposedly random T-intersection. But as they approached, they noticed that the two buildings slid to the side. A third building rose from the ground, propping up between them. The occupants in both buildings didn't seem to notice as the third building popped up between them. This new building was a temple, decorated with stars and scrolls on it. Anyone with history or religion could tell that this was a shrine to Azuth, hidden away in the trades ward. 
So the next section of the game, have the players kind of play through their way through a trap-laden dungeon to find the shard. Uh, going through the temple, they encountered a few traps and puzzles. Uh, the first room involved a sliding block uh, where the players, when they stepped on one side, it caused the sliding block to slip towards them, uh, but they kind of needed to get it to move to get access to the next room. Uh, then another room where there was a set of these copies of themselves, like a mirror, uh, but with different things on the other side that they had to use their illusory images to unlock the door. Uh, then the last puzzle I had them go through was there was a, um, they had to fight their way up a cylindrical room where there was an enchantment on the walls that would give them wall walks. So they could, but they could, it would let them like walk around the room in circles. But eventually they got up to the top of the temple where they suddenly activated a trap, creating a wall of force at the top of the stairs. Ha ha ha, it appears you have fallen for my devious scheme. There's a robed figure with long dark hair turning around. Look upon me in despair, for the whispers were true. It is I, the real Manchun. Who else could have laid out this cleverly devised scheme to trap unwitting adventurers in a cunning maneuver to find out what someone else knows about the shards of Golor? He holds up what the players can only assume as a shard of Golor. But as he was talking, ha, 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 it appears as if my brilliant plan has succeeded. Appearing from the corner was another Manchun. Do not be deceived by him. This one is merely a clone. The new Manchun says, well, who else but the real Manchun could have taken away the real shard of Golor? The new one holds up a shard of Golor. I stole yours, the fake Manchun, and replaced it with a phony. Ah, third voice said, you fools. I have played you like fiddles fiddling on fiddlesticks. Revealing himself was a third Manchun. He pulls out a shard of Golor. The stone is mine. The first Manchun goes, Bah, you really didn't think I noticed? For I have replaced my own with the phony and stole back the stone. So basically, they each of them is holding up two shards, each claiming that they have stolen from the other one. Now all the Manchun start arguing with each other. One of them was like, you are all jerks. I mean, no one invited you. You just show up and ruin other people's evil schemes. Do you think you can just butt in to my plan? What do you mean? You're the one butting into my evil schemes as the real Manchun. Nana piped up, oh, that's so sad. You just need to talk to yourself just to sit down and learn to work with yourself. As they're arguing, the wall of force expired. They now have three Manchuns, each holding up two shards of Golor each insisting that each one was the real one. The three Manchuns started fighting amongst themselves. Our tiefling warlock tried to cast Fireball, but it got counterspelled. After a bit of fighting, Ren cast his trademark Fear on the Manchuns, but since they had already used up their counterspells on the Fireball, they weren't able to roll for this one. Two of them drop whatever they're holding, which are the Shards of Golor, and flee far into the room. Nana and Tuff dash forward, grab the four stones, and the group dashes out of the room. As they escape, the group could hear cackling, lightning spells, and the boom of explosions as the three wizards were still duking it out. As much as they hated the players, they hated each other even more. The group quickly dashes down the stairs towards the exit of the temple. Nana was leading the group forward, and she goes, Stop! Everyone hide! Hey, what's up? They go, God fucking damn it. Outside they hear, What a clever plan, Silgar, waiting for them to find the stone and forcing them to give it to us. Outside was the Beholder Crime Lord himself, Xanathar. Telf was like, wow, they're after this rock. I guess you could say it looks like we're between a rock and a hard place. By the way, I want that goldfish. Why? He's super cute. I want a new friendo. As the players waited inside of the temple, with the sounds of the Manchuns behind them, and the Beholder and the rest of his gang out front, that was where that session ended.